from the Center for Social Justice and uh, Socialist Project in TTEC York. This is the beginning of tonight's election debate, I think maybe. That's what <laughs> yeah. we're all trying for. Martin's going to kind of intervene with his uh, particular interventions. Uh, tonight's book launch by Martin uh, uh, Lukash is uh, The Trudeau Formula Seduction and Betrayal in an Age of Discontent. Uh, I think everything in that is the way we're feeling right now. It captures all, everything kind of in that title. Uh, the sponsors tonight uh, bringing this together are the Council of Canadians Toronto, the Centre for Social Justice, Socialist Project, and Black Rose Books. Uh, uh, Charmaine Khan will chair, Martin will speak about the book, and Russ uh, uh, Dialbo and Judy Rebick will respond to uh, some of their uh, comments and uh, 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 some of the contents of the book and kind of debate Martin a little bit and praise him as well, I'm sure. Uh, oh, no, no, I stacked the... the you stacked? Oh, we're so only getting praised. Any, uh, we're praise debate. <laughs> Somehow, with Russ and Judy, I think... <laughs> we might find some. <laughs> yeah, something will come up. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Workers' Action Centre for hosting us uh, here tonight. Uh, they've been great over the last few years of kind of hosting an incredible amount of numbers of talks and events here and uh, 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 groups from a lot of the different political perspectives. I'd also uh, like to acknowledge the First Nations of the territories where we are live on and are meeting, the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Seneca, here in Wadet, neutrals and other peoples whose ancestors first lived here. Uh, also, the uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit, uh, who, uh, uh, who are with the, the treaty that was signed related to the Toronto Purchase over the last few years. Part of the land acknowledgement is a point of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, a push and demand that all of us recognize the historical colonization of the territories uh, uh, of what we now call Canada. Uh, this is an important element of, uh, of dealing with uh, the inequalities and uh, problems of our society. Uh, hopefully it'll be a big issue in the election. It is a crucial uh, issue of holding the, this government to account over how they dealt with First Nations issues. <laughs> and turn it over to Charmaine. Charmaine, okay. take over the chair. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so what we're going to be doing tonight is um, I'm going to uh, introduce Martin. He'll talk a bit. And then we have a few questions uh, for Martin and for also for the panelists about their reactions to the book or to the you know current political climate, but also um, hear about Judy and Russ's um, activism um, as they've seen many decades of different governments, including different liberal governments. Um, it's really great to have a full room. I'm actually thinking because of the crowd, maybe people thought that um, Martin was perhaps a descendant of another famous Marxist, uh, George Lukash. Um, I, I can pass it around, it's a great read. Um, um, but um, while there is probably some stuff here on reification and dialectics, um, it is a very different book. Um, and um, I'm just going to quickly introduce the, the panelists. Um, I want to thank Martin for inviting me to chair. Um, he was actually my boss for a few years, um, and so when he asked me, I just automatically said yes, because it was like muscle memory. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm really happy to be here and support him. Um, he didn't coerce me at all. Um, so, um, he also didn't give me a bio, so I can actually have free reign to describe him. Um, so I've known Martin for um, maybe close to 10 years now, and I actually met him when we were actually all active with the media co-op, um, which is still around, and he was really vital to the, the strength and growth of that alternative activist media project. He's also been a contributor for many years to The Guardian, uh, the British Guardian, um, and is a prolific writer for many publications. He also um, fa helped found The Leap, or worked for The Leap, and helped found uh, their manifesto. Um, and this is his first book, so congratulations on the, on the first, on your first book. Um, I'm going to introduce Judy next. Um, so Judy is uh, one of Canada's best known feminists. Um, she also was an old prof of mine when I took communications at Ryerson. Um, she's a former president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and was a spokesperson for the pro-choice campaign that won legal abortion in Canada in the 1980s. From 2002 until 2010, Judy held the Sam Gindon Chair in Social Justice and Democracy, having been appointed upon its creation. 
She has ho also hosted two national TV shows on CBC in the 1990s and was the founding publisher of Ravel.ca, another active, a really important activist media project. Um, she has a long history of political activism as well, having been a co-founder of the New Politics Initiative, an attempt to transform the NDP in 2001. Uh, Judy has authored several <laughs> books, including uh, 10,000 Roses, Transforming Power from the Personal to the Political, The Making of a Feminist Revolution, and her most uh, recent memoir, Heroes in My Head. And Judy has worked as an ally with Indigenous people from Oka to Ida Lamour, with a special effort to support Indigenous women during the Charlottetown Accord. Um, beside Judy is Russ, Russell Diabo, uh, born December 25th in 1955. Uh, he is a son of a Kanawake Mohawk ironworker and a member of the Mohawk Nation. Russell has worked for Indigenous rights for more than 40 years and served as the AFN as an advisor for two national chiefs. As a writer and editor of the First Nations Strategic Bulletin, he has been covering the dependent development of Indigenous policy for Canada in the last 20 years and is recognized as, the most, as one of the most foremost Indigenous policy analysts in the country, while at the same time he has continued to work with the bands of the, at the community level and with indigenous <coughs> activists and defenders of the land, which he co-founded with Arthur Manuel in 2008. Russell was president of Wounded Knee during the 1973 standoff when he was 17, and he then went to study native issues at UC Berkeley, Trent University, and Laurentian University. Um, he's been married for 30 years to John Aquat from Saskatchewan. They have five children between them, and they're also proud grandparents of six grandchildren. Um, and they're also both personal heroes of Martin, as you'll read in the book. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm just gonna hand it over to Martin to just describe this book you wrote um, for a few minutes, and then we're gonna just have a conversation for around 30 to 40 minutes, and then open it up to the crowd for a few minutes. I get to pick who asks the questions. Um, so <laughs> smile nicely. And, um, and then we're just gonna, we can chill for the rest of the evening and talk with each other about the book and eat some food, so. Um, thanks to Socialist Project and uh, Council of Canadians for uh, bringing some snacks. Okay. Oh. No, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah. just some, some, uh, some no, it's okay. I, it's my fault. <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks, thanks so much, Charmian. Uh, that was a very sweet introduction. Uh, besides being Charmian's boss, that's not that's not the limit of our relationship. Charmian is also a friend and a collaborator, and she's also been a mentor to me as well. So. Um, and the same goes for, for Russ and, uh, and Judy. Um, and that was definitely like the best pronunciation of my last name. There's a bit of a running like competition for who can pronounce that last name the best. And Greg, I definitely expect more from Marxist academics. <laughs> <laughs> but Charmaine, Charmaine definitely is t in the running for top position. Um, and speaking of, um, speaking of last name pronunciations, uh, Russ's last name, uh, uh, you pronounce it in, in a way that phonetically is probably the closest to how a lot of federal government officials know, namely Diablo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely considered a freaking devil by the, the, the bureaucrats that he has been fighting for 30, 40 years. Um, so I, uh, in, in Montreal and in Ottawa, I definitely forgot to thank a few people, so I'm not going to make that same mistake, so I've, I've written them out this time. So. So definitely like to Umer and Tanner and uh, Greg and Tara from the Council of Canadians for helping organize this. And it's really great to have it at the Workers Action Center, which is just a powerhouse for organizing with um, low income, precarious workers, predominantly women, racialized and immigrant uh, folks. So um, really happy to have it here in this space. Um, I have a lot of loved loved ones and friends in the room and, and family as well. My my great aunt and uncle are here. Um, and it's setting probably your first time being in a, a political space with me, so um, hopefully you won't get freaked out. Though I do know you have some, social, some socialism in your background, so. Um, I, uh, my family, when we were growing up, I think they subscribed to the Globe and Mail, so I, I would really love going to their place because they had the Toronto Star. <laughs> and uh, it was just totally thrilling uh, to be you know, exposed to the outer limits of permissible dissent and discourse in the Canadian media. Obviously, I have a very different opinion of the Toronto Star now, but that was a really important kind of step in my political journey. Um, who else is here? Um, I don't think Dar and Sebastian are here yet. 
but they housed me in Ottawa when I had to make far more trips to that city than I, than I really would have preferred to, to write this book. Um, uh, Priti Daliwa was a really incredible encouragement um, for the writing of this book. Um, there, is, there is someone in the room who I want to anonymously thank, because they're the ones who helped me uh, secretly slip in to the uh, Laurier Club, the exclusive top donors lounge at the uh, Halifax Convention of the Liberal Party. I wondered how you did that. And it makes for one of the more vivid, vivid <laughs> scenes in the book, just basically watching like the corporate lobbyists circling the, the MPs, um, dining at you know, a very high level kind of buffet. Um, I want to thank uh, Donya Ziai, who's my, uh, my partner. Um, she, among other things, uh, helped edit the book. Um, and I really couldn't have finished it without you. Um, also, she helpfully has tried to spruce up the place with these, uh, I don't know if most people can see them. There's some sunflowers here in the corner. <laughs> this space is a little bit sterile, but. So thank you for all your many efforts uh, and patience and encouragement. Um, and I guess the last thank you is to um, members of kind of Canada's liberal intelligentsia who were probably the first to inspire me to write this book. Um, I wrote a piece comparing Justin Trudeau very unfavorably to Jeremy Corbyn about two years ago in The Guardian. Mm -hmm. And um, certain members of the liberal intelligentsia just kind of had this like epic meltdown. Um, <laughs> Stephen Marsh, who's this writer for G. Esquire, GQ, and The Walrus called it a work of, um, called it the piece of, a work of staggering stupidity and willful blindness. Uh, Emmett McFarlane, who's a well-known kind of pundit and legal scholar, called it a, a trash can, a, a garbage, a trash can of, a trash can on fire of an article. Um, and then Gerald Butts took some time off from his, you know, very busy schedule running the country to call the art article ridiculous. Um, and so I thought to myself, if this is the reaction to an article, how will they react if I write a whole book? Um, and so that, I, I kind of set off doing that. Um, but I guess also that, that whole episode, to me, was a really revealing uh, testament to how dearly uh, attached uh, the Liberal Party is and, and their apologists and their defenders to the notion that they are a progressive force uh, for change in this country. Um, and in many ways it's kind of their kryptonite because it is the, the, the most profound and potent part of their, of their marketing pitch, right? Um, that basically, you know, dates back in some ways to, you know, Mackenzie King. Uh, so I really kind of want to understand how exactly they pull that off so successfully. Um, and, you know, there are, I mean, a lot of people in this room probably kind of knew what the liberals were about. But I wanted to explain not just to left, leftists, uh, but also to a mainstream audience, um, how they pull that operation off. So I, I kind of went about trying to like, observe the liberal power broker, the liberal decision maker in their natural habitat. So I, I went, you know, I kind of went on the liberal circuit. I, I hit the conventions. I went to the kind of like, you know, confabs that the, their favorite think tanks run. I um, I went to the, the Canadian Weapons Trade Show. I went to the you know public private pu public private partnership association meeting in Toronto, um, and um, so I kind of felt like I was taking one for the team because uh, a lot a lot of those spaces are um, as you'll see in the book. Like Russ was Russ was asking me about how I how my experience at the the Weapons Trade Show, and I. I mean, I felt dirty for like days afterwards. Um, it, you know, it's a pretty unseemly kind of environment. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll just talk for like another minute or two, um, summing up the book and then we can jump into conversation. Uh, so what's the Trudeau formula? Um, the liberals talk a very good game, and they certainly did in the run up to the last election, about transforming society on behalf of the 99% while managing to very quietly assure the 1% that things won't actually change. Um, and, you know, Trudeau was kind of like the key, the crown jewel in this formula. He was this kind of like woke politician from this, the future, a kind of dazzling simulation of, of, of defiance against the status quo. Um, this kind of like walking, talking, TED talk, you know, that, that, made, that made fundamental change seem so easy and, uh, and free of conflict. Um, and 
you know, in, in, in many ways, I think this formula is an attempt to, uh, to channel and absorb the rising discontent in this country. Uh, and that, that is, in some ways, kind of part of the DNA of the Liberal Party for, for, for decades. And I'd love to hear from Judy and Russ about how they've, how they've played that, whether it was the 90s or earlier. In every generation, they seem to pull this off, and we, we, don't, really, we don't really get wise to it. Um, and I, I think there's definitely like a bit of humility that would be useful for us, because they pull it off with an incredible amount of skill. Um, it, and they, they manage somehow to kind of pass off the preferred policies of the corporate elite as a progressive option. And you know whether that's the carbon tax, which in many ways was the preferred strategy of the corporate elite, or the entire reconciliation agenda, um, or militarism. I mean, there's been almost not a peep of criticism about the fact that under Trudeau, military funding has been increased 70% over the next 10 years. You know, if that had happened under Harper, we'd probably be howling about the rise of a military state in this country. Um, and, you know, the immigration system as well. I mean, this is a, you know, a system that basically has seen an uptick in, in the amount of migrants who come into this country who are practically warehoused uh, under incredibly exploitative situ conditions uh, to drive down wages um, and lower working conditions in this country. And yet somehow we have this impression that you know, the immigration, this in immigration system in this country is like the equivalent, equivalent of like stuffed, stuffed animals and hugs at the airport. Um, so, so I kind of wanted to understand how, how exactly they pull that off. Um, and um, I think that, yeah, I think there's certainly something to be, to be learned from how they do that. Um, I guess the question is, is like, does, does the Trudeau formula have, have lasting power? And I think, it, I think in many ways the Trudeau brand was seen across the world by the kind of global liberal establishment as um, the last best hope of this kind of politics of neoliberalism that, um, you know, ideologically is, uh, is in tatters, right? Um, there's an incredible challenge we're seeing from a really ugly resurgent right um, that is channeling a lot of the discontent that Trudeau tried, I think, to co-opt and manage. Um, and they're channeling it, as we know, uh, towards, um, you know, scapegoating, uh, towards, uh, you know, the bashing and fear-mongering about migrants, about indigenous people, um, about, you know, as we're seeing in Alberta now, about so-called foreign-funded radicals. Um, so the question is, and of course, in, in, in tow, there's this, you know, um, resurgence also in white, full, full-blown white supremacy. I mean, we've seen since the election of Trudeau, uh, tripling in the number of active white supremacist groups. Um, so, they're besieged by the, the right, but I don't think that the right can be defeated by liberal po policies, which only marginally alleviate some of those conditions that have created the, those grievances and that pain in this country that's being taken advantage of by the right. Only the left wing can do that. And you know, my, my book makes an argument that, that, that it's really important for us to offer that kind of bold alternative. Um, and it's not like people aren't ready for it. Like, I don't know if people saw the, the poll from the forum research uh, polling company just like a week or two ago, but 60% six, of Canadians are, have, a, have a positive view of socialism, um, which is really incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, Canadians are a bit too polite because they apparently also have, 60% of them also have a positive view of capitalism. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, I'm old enough to remember when socialism was like a dirty word that we kind of whispered to each other at parties. Um, and now young people are like putting it on their Tinder profiles. Uh, we have a shouty Jewish man who identifies as one who has a very good chance of becoming the next president of the United States of America. Um, so, and I think people in this, hung in this country are hungry for those kinds of politics. So the, the book is very hopeful. Um, I, I, I end the book writing about uh, the Green New Deal, um, which I think is the most powerful antidote we have to uh, the politics of the Liberal Party. And I write about um, our very own Canadian precursor to uh, the Green New Deal, the Leap Manifesto. Um, and you know, when, when it had its kind of successful incursion into the NDP, it showed to my mind just how much hunger there is for this kind of politics. I mean, 
there was a single poll that showed that you know upwards of 50 to 60 percent of Canadians want exactly those kinds of policies, and we saw simultaneously this like epic tantrum that got thrown by the corporate and political and media establishment. And you know, just a few blocks from here at the Shangri-La Hotel, uh, one of the top floors, a week after that convention happened. Um, Brian Mulroney gave a speech to uh, the 40th anniversary of um, the Business Council of Canada's um, meeting. Um, and he was like, guys, uh, quit celebrating. I know that you guys have basically remade this country in the image of corporate interests, but we have a problem on our hands. Uh, the kind of ideas that are emerging now and growing popular, I thought I had consigned to the dust of history under my reign. Uh, and instead they're back, and in his words, uh, they amounted to a philosophy of, this is a direct quote, a philosophy of economic nihilism that must be resisted and defeated. Um, so I think one of the messages of the book too is, is I think in, in, in many cases, the corporate elite have a much keener appreciation of just how compelling and potentially winning a popular agenda we have in something like the Green New Deal. And the book is an exhortation that people in the progressive majority in this country need to catch up and realize um, how close we are to providing that for people. Um, so I hope it's a, a, something of a tool for, for people to use in, in their movements. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to um, basically turn it over to Judy and Wes for some comments. Um, I had a starting question, if that's okay, but sure. you can also have your own question or comment. You're the MC, you're in charge. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to be horizontal. Um, <laughs> um, so my first question is actually curiosity uh, from both of you because you've um, been um, on the forefront of, uh, of different struggles. Um, and of very radical progressive struggles around um, with different governments and have had positions both on this like both roles on the streets but also where you get to actually sit with um, with people in government in the liberal government um, around uh, you know uh, different uh, campaigns and struggles and so I'm wondering if both of you could maybe offer some reflections about the change in uh, the little party with the emergence of the Trudeau number two uh, right now and um, and that reflection around kind of um, being on the streets, but then also having to sit with government negotiations. Okay. Well, um, first of all, thank you for writing this book. It's really, it's really a good book, and I learned things I didn't know, which I didn't think I would. <laughs> and um, also, the timing is really, really important because the biggest thing that's changed is that people are believing their bullshit more. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. People are, you know, and they're not, it's not that they think the liberals are great, it's that they think that Sheer represents such a danger that you have to vote liberal to stop him, right? Mm -hmm. And my view has been for a very long time, decades even, that the liberals are much more dangerous than the conservatives. Yeah. And I've had that view for a long time. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is, and, and it, so I'm gonna go back to my, experience as a, as a TV host, more than my experience in politics. When I was on Face Off, which was a left-right debate show, so first of all, we, we debated issues. There was never a liberal on my side of an issue in four years. Never. Okay? On every issue, the liberals are on the opposite side of the table. Okay? From me, the right side of it, the right wing side of the table. Okay? And secondly, what I found was the conservatives, I never agreed with them but they actually believed in something. <laughs> and the liberals didn't. Now, I'm not saying there isn't anybody in the liberal party who has uh, you know, beliefs, I'm sure there are, but the ones who they put up to be their spokespeople, they don't believe in anything. They'll say anything, right? And that's much more dangerous to me. So I've been very upset in the last six months or so, well, since the Jody Wilson-Raybould thing, how many people on my Facebook page, and that's what I'm talking about, which is, uh, you know, I have a lot of followers, and they're all, most of them are, I think, left of center, are saying, you have, you have, why are you talking about this? Why, you know, trying to vilify 
uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and J Jane Philpott. Why are you talking about this? Do you want Scheer to be prime minister? And actually thinking that electing the liberals are going to improve something, right? So, so I'm, I really like the part of the book where you show how the liberals are actually much more aligned with the interests of, of the, with the politics of the corporate elite, especially that Stephen Harper's Tories were. And it, that was a really interesting part of the book where uh, that Stephen Harper actually kept his distance from everybody but the oil barons, right? Like from the banks and all that. So that was interesting because he's a libertarian. Um, and to really realize through all that little spying that you did, um, <laughs> you know, because we don't get to see that, right? None of us get to see that. You know, th them in their own world. Habitat, you said. Their own, <laughs> yeah, habitat. Right? <laughs> them in their natural habitat. Um, yeah, so, so, so that, I think that's a really important part of the book, and it's very uh, well documented. And then the other thing, I guess, from the point of view of my experience with the liberals, is that, I mean, Everything, every fight that I, I've ever been involved in that won was under a Tory government. And that's the thing you're talking about, right? Which is people are much more willing to fight. I'm not saying it'd be good for the, believe me, for the Tories to win <laughs> electorally, federally. But just that people are more willing to fight when there's a Tory government. Because the Liberals, you know, I mean, I think Kathleen Wynne was actually a progressive person. I think she was. I mean, Trudeau, I don't think, is. Um, but still, the interest of the party is the interest of corporations, and it always has been, and it always will be. Um, and so th this is what I found most useful about the book, um, is documenting their connections. Where I, I'd like to hear you talk more is how do you deal with the things they've done that is good? Like, for example, in the pro-choice struggle, now we think of the Liberal Party as being strongly pro-choice. And on, you know, I'd give Justin Trudeau that. He is strongly pro-choice. He won't allow any candidates to be anti-choice, and I think that's great. But when we were fighting on the choice issue, it wasn't Liberal women. Who, very, yeah, we were Liberal women. It was the Tory women that were our allies. Oh. Mm -hmm. It was the Tory women that stepped, like Pat Carney, who was our enemy on free trade, mm -hmm. right? She flew from Vancouver to Ottawa to vote against Mulroney's attempt to recriminalize abortion. And she lost her job in the cabinet as a result. I've never seen a liberal cabinet except for Jody wilson Reeble. <laughs> Another liberal cabinet minister do that, right? So, um, so I'm not saying, like, I'm, I, I just think people understand that what the conservatives are, and they're dangerous and terrible, but I don't think people really understand what the liberals are, and so I think you're right, you were right. In the, so how do you deal with where they're good on, they are better on social yeah. issues, and social issues, particularly on women's issues, and this, this is important to us, uh, to half the population, maybe all the population, and so how do you deal, like, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you, you say, well, you know, better to have the liberals and the Tories, because at least they won't recriminalize abortion. How do, you, how do you answer that? It's challenging. I, I, I mean, there's a chapter in the in the book that I had to shed near the end in order to finish it. But I I tried to grapple with the the this history of how the liberals have fused socially liberal policies with uh, financially conservative ones. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a generally that that history is associated the the third way is associated with Blair and with Clinton. Um, but what was fascinating is that I spoke to you know advisors of Blair, who told me that actually Chrétien was in some ways seen as a as a godfather of that movement, um, and it is it is hard to it is hard to fight um, because we see them, you know, um, fusing a very sh shallow kind of superficial um, version of uh, you know women's rights. Uh, indigenous rights, environmental right. politics, um, LGBTQ rights, um, uh, fusing that with uh, the policies uh, and preferences of Bay Street, and it's tricky. I don't, I don't, I don't think one can, f I don't think one can fight that uh, analytically or by pointing out the, the the lineage or the. I think one can only fight that with a, a distinct, unapologetically bold alternative that uh, that 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 both uh, wins social, racial, uh, and gender justice alongside, um, you know, the kind of economic policies that lift 
the, the, the well-being of the majority of people in this country. Because that's, the, that's, that's the, that, that kind of lethalized neoliberal politics with that progressive gloss is precisely what's gotten us into the, the mess we're in here and what, what we saw in the United States as well, right? And that's what created so much opportunity for someone like Trump um, to come across as an answer to people's pain and grievances, right? Um, so the only way to do it, is, I think, is politically. Um, and I agree too about the, the first thing you were saying about um, that their kind of chameleon-like nature is very, is very difficult because they, they're very good at telling different audiences different things. Um, and there's actually a quote from, um, from Marx, uh, not Karl Groucho, <laughs> which, which kind of sum, sums up that, that, that politics. Um, uh, and his line is, uh, here are my principles. Well, if you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, it's tricky. To, it's tricky. It's, it's, tri very it's, it's tricky to fight, <laughs> and you really have to juxtapose. You really have to line up the myth and reality. Um, and and our media certainly doesn't do that. Um, the problem with our media is that there there's kind of two currents within the media: a, a, a liberal and a conservative one. And the liberal ones just give us the sense that uh, you know the good intentions of the liberals have simply gone awry. That's why these progressive policies have been implemented. Uh, or the dastardly conservatives are, are, are an obstacle to it. And the, and, the, and the line of critique from the conservatives is that you know, liberals are tax and spend crypto socialists, right? And it only reinforces the image that the conservative, that the liberals covet of being this kind of progressive anti-establishment party. So uh, it's very hard to for people to, to get a, get their handle on it, certainly by reading the main, mainstream media in this country. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I have a different take. Okay. That's what I expect me to address. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, from an indigenous perspective, you know, um, first of all, I, I think your book's excellent. You know, I enjoyed the different stories you told. I was curious as to how you snuck into all those places, <laughs> including the weapons convention. But also, you know, the liberal convention, because I've been in, I was a liberal insider, as you know, and I, I've been to those conventions, so I know what they're like. Um, you know, so thank you for writing the book, especially the reconciliation industry. I got a lot of uh, insights there, things I didn't know. Didn't surprise me, but it confirmed a lot of what I knew. Um, you know, <clears throat> for me, looking at, first of all, the way I view Canadian the Canadian state and Canadian society is that it's a racist colonial and as the murdered missing women inquiry concluded a genocidal state and society particularly towards indigenous women and girls um, so you know I, I've talked about what I call constitutional racism but as I've said recently I and I told that to um, Elizabeth May at the AFN uh, Chiefs Assembly in Fredericton in July, I said, you know, she's talking about, oh, we want to get rid of the Indian Act. And I said, well, it's not the Indian Act. They said, it's constitutional racism you got to deal with. That's what I was trying to tell her. But on reflection, I said, it's really constitutional genocide because it's the constitutional framework of this country that's created the situation that we're in for Indigenous peoples, going with the first constitution, the BNA Act of 1867, the Division of Federal and Provincial Powers where they said Indians and lands reserved for Indians are a subject matter. And then they passed the Indian Act. And now more, more recently, First Nations legislation using 9124 uh, powers, you know, that section of the uh, Constitution. And, um, you know, um, I was around actually at school at Trent in Native Studies in 1980 when Pierre Trudeau came to a meeting of the National Indian Brotherhood, which is what AFN was called before. It became. Before, <coughs> before the Assembly of First Nations was called the National Indian Brotherhood. So in 1980, um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau met with them at the Skyline Hotel, which is now, I think, uh, the Delta Hotel in Ottawa. And uh, he came there to the chief's meeting and said to them, um, I want you to treat Canada better than Canada's treated you. And then he announced that he was going to patriate the Constitution. This was in 1980. And then, of course, you know, there was the whole issue about how Section 35 of the Constitution was uh, put in there. They said that they recognized in the draft Constitution, that they recognized and affirmed the Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples. But Lougheed and um, 
Blakeney wanted it taken out. You know, the, the uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta premiers wanted it removed. And Jean Chrétien, who was Mr. White Paper to us, was the Justice Minister at the time negotiating this for Pierre Trudeau. And he agreed to take it out. And that's when, um, you know, Aboriginal peoples and their allies in Canada started agitating to put that section back in because, you know, many, many felt that it was better to be included in the new constitution rather than be excluded because they were concerned about what would happen to Aboriginal treaty rights if a new constitution came in and it didn't mention them. Uh, but there was a big debate internally about that. There wasn't consensus. But the ones amongst the ones that were pushing for that were the Union of East Indian Chiefs, George Manuel, um, the former second president of the National Indian Brotherhood, pushed for it. And he organized a train to go from Vancouver to Ottawa called the Constitution Express. And actually it was two trains. They joined up in Thunder Bay, but one went south and one went north, picking up you know, people along the way. And by the time they got to Ottawa, they joined together and, you know, the mayor, um, Mayor Endure, I remember she was asking everybody in Ottawa to billet uh, the people from the train because they didn't have hotels and stuff. They, these are people that came with their own money, paid their own ticket, who were on welfare, uh, who believed in the fight, you know, to be included in this new constitution. And um, that's how I viewed the Liberals, was out from the lens of looking at what Pierre Trudeau was doing to us then. And um, he, he did reinsert it with the word existing to limit future interpretations of Section 35. They put it in that says, we hereby recognize and affirm the existing Aboriginal and Treaty Rights of Aboriginal Peoples. But along with the new constitution, they put in Section 37, which said within one year of that new constitution becoming law, there has to be a First Minister's Conference on Aboriginal Matters to identify and define the meaning of Aboriginal Treaty Rights in section 35. Well, in 1983, they had that meeting, and what they did in that meeting was they amended the Constitution, and they added in, uh, for greater certainty, treaty rights includes land claims agreements that have been settled or may be settled. So that's the origin of this modern treaties. But I always thought that Trudeau pulled a fast one on us because the, the historic treaties weren't called land claims. In order to get access into our territories as indigenous nations, you, you know, there had to be treaties or you didn't get in. You know, out here in the east, you know, right away uh, across, uh, even in the prairies, you know, there was still a lot of pressure to do treaty making. And um, so they added that in to create a new class of treaties. And I always viewed the modern treaties as undermining the historic treaties, because they never addressed them. And um, basically, they ran out the clock. They said there'd be three more First Minister's Conferences. They ran out the clock on it. The issue became a self-government inherent right, or is it a delegated you know, contingent right, condition on reaching agreements with Crown governments? By the time, you know, Maroney, Trudeau started it, Pierre Trudeau, Trudeau ended it as chair. It ended in 87, they did Meech Lake. We saw what Elijah did to that, Elijah Harper in 1990, Oka happened. And it was around that time that I got involved in national politics as I was part of the group that helped get the Liberal Party of Canada's constitution amended to create an Aboriginal Peoples Commission in 1990 in Calgary at the same convention that Jean Chrétien was elected in as leader. Russ calls this period of his life a disastrous experiment. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> but I was talked into, you know, we didn't like Maroney. We didn't like what he was doing. A good friend of mine, David Nawagabo, an Ojibwe lawyer, uh, who was talked into getting involved in the Liberals with Senator Len Marchand, an Aboriginal senator. Um, so Dave talked me into it and said, well, you're always complaining about governments not knowing what they're doing, and now's your chance to work with, a you know, before they formed the government, a party to help shape their platform. So he sucked me in and I did say, I'll try it as an experiment. And um, so in 1990, they amended their constitution, creating the commission. Um, same time, that same week, that's when Meech Lake died. People were coming up to me thinking I was Elijah Harper. <laughs> and um, Clyde Wells came there and they all had security around him because he was the one that got all the credit for killing Meech, not Elijah. Because you can't have an Indian get credit. And um, 
And then uh, a few weeks later, July 11th, uh, 1990, that's when the shootout at Gunasadage happened and Corporal LeMay was killed in the shootout and, and that led to like a 78 day standoff. And Audrey McLaughlin had come to an emergency Quebec Chiefs meeting, you know, an NDP leader at the time. And I called up and I said, well, why isn't Cretchen here? He's the leader of the opposition. He should be at this meeting. Mm -hmm. So he was at his cottage and somebody got hold of him and we were able to pull him in. And uh, so he came to the meeting and he announced, well, I'm going to Gunasadagi to meet with them, you know, in, in the Pines. And I had to call them in the Pines in the treatment center and say, well, will you meet with Cretchen? Because I didn't know he was going to announce that. Um, but, you know, being the policy vice president for the commission, I kind of had to do that because he announced he was going to do that. So I was on the inside. Um, Cretchen went over to Gunasadagi. The SQ made us. <coughs> the SQ made us uh, wait for two hours, including Cretchen. He announced he was going to leave. Then they came up with ten names. I said, oh, "Who could go into Oka? You know, we're going to Sadagi. This is like a ten at night, so the sun's going down." So it was me, Dave Nawagabo, uh, Ethel Blondin, Cretchen, Cretchen's driver, Jack DeChambeau, I think his name was. He was Pierre Trudeau's driver too. Um, there was a few others of us. So we're going up, getting to the top of the hill, and all these masked uh, warriors are coming up with guns saying, hi Russ, hi Russ. <laughs> and Cretchen turns around to look at me like, what did you get me into when it was his <laughs> idea to go there? <laughs> but anyway, see, he went there and said he could help get the talk started. I mean, he did get them restarted. But my experience with the Liberals, you know, was on the inside fighting to get, um, you know, Indigenous issues in on the platform for the 1993 election. Um, we also had to convince Cretchen to support the Charlottetown Accord. Uh, so we enlisted the help of Keith Penner, who was, you know, Cretchen's cohort, you know, the age group, the Penner Report on Indian Self-Government. We had to get him involved because, you know, Cretchen looked at us as kids, but he wouldn't listen to us. So we were involved in doing that platform. And um, when we first approached them about doing it, Haviva Hosak, I don't know if you know her, she was the research uh, director, Liberal Research Party director, uh, for the for the campaign. She was saying, "Well, if we recognize you Aboriginal people in the platform, the Italians and the Greeks and everybody else are going to want to be involved." And we said, "Wait a minute. You know, they don't. They aren't constitutionally entrenched in the Constitution. Their rights aren't there. You know, as Canadians, but not as groups, right? So they had to admit that's true." And so they agreed to do to include a section in the Red Book. Uh, it was Chapter Seven. It wound up being, but we also got them to do a longer uh, platform when Gretchen was on the, the, the trail. So, you know, they they recognized that a liberal government would act on the premise that um, Section Thirty Five of the Constitution already included the inherent right to self-government. A whole bunch of other uh, things were in there, promises in uh, that platform. We had vetted it with a lot of people, a lot of people had input into it, we were pretty transparent on how we developed it, and um, people liked it. And the problem was when Cretchen formed a majority government, he named his Minister of Indian Affairs Ron Irwin, and we said, who the hell is this? Hmm. Turns out he was the Parliamentary Secretary for Cretchen when Cretchen was Justice Minister negotiating the new Constitution. So he was an old crony, he was a former mayor of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, anyways, he became the new Minister of Indian Affairs, and um, Cretchen ignored and broke or manipulated all those promises. He imposed an inherent right to self-government policy without consultation, um, which basically is not an inherent right policy. It's, it's saying you have to recognize federal and provincial, the existing constitutional framework of Canada, federal and provincial orders of government, their jurisdictions, and uh, if you want to exercise self-government, it has to be delegated authority. For example, under Section 92 powers of the province, you have to get the province to have an okay or they get a veto. That's essentially still what's going on now, is that 1995 policy is what Justin Trudeau is still implementing. And by the way, Justin Trudeau is implementing his land tenants policies um, up to now have been his father's, because his father announced the comprehensive and specific land claims policies in 1973 
and uh, that's what he's been implementing is his dad's uh, policies. No. Although in BC, he's starting to change that for comprehensive claims. He just announced a new BC treaty negotiation policy. But my point is, the way I look at the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party is that um, how do they measure up on Indigenous issues? And really, in a lot of ways, I'd have to say, too, I've found that the Conservative governments have been easier to make agreements with than the Liberal governments. Um, you know, I worked with the Algonquins of Barrier Lake. We got uh, Moroni under his executive federalism to sign a trilateral agreement with the Algonquins in 1991. Uh, after you know, year after Oka, that was the first agreement in Quebec after Oka. Um, you know, there were other examples where um, you know Moroni was after Oka was more uh, progressive. Um, but the Liberals under Cretchen, he instituted a lot of uh, a lot of things like he passed this uh, First Nations Land Management Act, Fiscal Management Act, basically to assimilate First Nations into Canada's property and taxation systems. They're saying if you want out of the Indian Act, here's other alternative legislation. Or you can negotiate a modern treaty where you extinguish title, or you can negotiate self-government where you'll be a municipal type government. So these are the options. And so I read your book and I see that, you know, the Liberals have put a new, they've rebranded termination as reconciliation, but it's still termination. Because um, the way that they work is they weaponized recognition and implementation of rights because they weaponized recognition. They're, they're saying, um, basically, they're setting up these recognition tables. The purpose of them is to develop, co-develop negotiating mandates to take the cabinet to approve, right? So they're non-binding discussions until you get that co-developed mandate. And they love buzzwords like this, co-develop. Yeah. But the trick is, they say in the, in the instructions they've just given to their officials just before the election, is that the uh, co-developed mandate has to be agreed to by all the parties, which basically means the federal and provincial negotiators, the governments have a veto in anything that touches on their areas of jurisdiction. So it means you can't raise an issue like self-determination or that unless it fits into accepting federal and provincial law applying over your traditional territory mm -hmm. and you having some delegated authority under that. So your book, I think, covers a lot of how they've tricked the public and many First Nations. Plus, they've co-opted a lot of the leadership with the money. You know, uh, AFN especially, Perry Belgard, uh, you know, I, I noticed how you named some names in there. You know, I think you, you named um, Ed John, Willie Littlechild, Phil Fontaine, of course, and Perry as being the ones who had exclusive access to ministers and the prime minister to do these half-day learning sessions at the Liberal Convention. Um, I didn't know that, but it makes sense that those would be the ones that they would use because that's who they've got placed helping them implement this national, what I call this national termination plan. And um, they're, they're well remunerated for it. But that's why I've been saying is our grassroots people don't know what's going on because these are chiefs' organizations, not people's. And the liberals know that and they took advantage of that and co-opted our leadership. So your book lays it out in terms of the broader sense of getting access to natural resources, helping corporations out, and that the liberal strategy indigenous policy was part of that too, as well as their approach on environmental issues. Um, so I thought you wove that all together pretty well. And as you know, I was involved in the Leap Manifesto workshopping stuff too, along with Art Manuel, the late Art Manuel. Um, so I'm familiar with how all that played out with the NDP. And, um, and I thought it was interesting the way you left your book open on the Green New Deal and the current election and the politics going on between the Green Party and the NDP. Because I can see that playing out now across the country and where the quote progressives unquote are gonna wind up in this election because for the ones that don't wanna go with the liberals or the conservatives, they don't have a lot of other choice other than looking at those two parties. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty interesting the way your book kind of ended on, on that because we're watching that all develop now and will evolve over the course of this election. Yeah, and Russ, I mean, Russ, Russ, Russ should give himself more credit because he really was the, one of the people who helped expose uh, this reconciliation agenda, this reconciliation industry for what it was because for the first few years of the Liberal government, uh, 
there was just a like a complete love-in from the media about their approach to indigenous peoples, right? And, and many First Nations people. Many First Nations people as well. And and Russ went on this uh, with Joanna, his partner, who's a great, terrific organizer. Uh, he put himself up for the leadership of the AFN uh, a year and a half ago, and they did a cross-country tour. They called it a ba Bannock and Baloney tour. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, we had an argument before. He thinks I give him too much credit. I don't think I do. I think that that campaign was really a catalyst, and it was the first time that uh, criticism of the Trudeau government's reconciliation politics appeared in the mainstream media. And it was real. Cat, real it, it caused a real shift. Um, and I actually think, interestingly, that the whole SNC Lavalin affair and Jody Wilson Raybould's uh, taking a stand is actually interwoven with this story. Because um, what's fascinating is that when Ross and others ultimately defeated this legislative part of Trudeau's reconciliation agenda, which has as as, it, as, as the end result the extinguishment of Aboriginal land rights and title. Um, you know, the continuation of this conservative agenda, uh, this bi a liberal, agenda. liberal conservative agenda. Uh, Russ and Russ really helped turn the tide. And I remember uh, being at this, and I described it in the book, being at this um, uh, AFN assembly on this legislation in Ottawa where. After the AFN election. After the AFN election, uh, <laughs> where basically you saw chiefs across the board almost united against this legislation. And the only person who wasn't in the room, interestingly, was Jody uh, Wilson-Raybould. And later, after the SNC-Lavalin affair broke, the mainstream media kind of scoured her, her record and her speeches for uh, you know, early signs of criticism. And what's fascinating to me is that the first time she started criticizing the Liberal government was the day after the piece of legislation that she had been intimately involved in pushing was defeated by Russ and others. Um, and so I think the, the, the stand she took ultimately had to do with um, you know, rehabilitating herself, rehabilitating her, her image in the indigenous community after her piece of legislation was defeated. Well, I have to say something about that. Jody Wilson-Raybould and I have never gotten along politically. Uh, her father, Bill Wilson, started the BC Treaty Extinguishing Process. You loud it, Russ? <coughs> Jody Wilson-Raybould and I never got along politically. Her father, Bill Wilson, started the BC Treaty Extinguishment Process in 1991-92. And um, Jody herself uh, was a commissioner on that BC Treaty Extinguishment Process and actually acting chief commissioner. And um, so she accepted the comprehensive claims policy, as did the others negotiating under it, uh, to extinguish title. <coughs> Arthur Manuel, who I worked closely with when he was alive, we tried to change the comprehensive land claims policy to remove extinguishment, especially after the 1997 Delgamuk uh, Supreme Court decision that said Aboriginal title exists in Canada. And, um, and then also when the Chilcotin decision came down in 2014, although we saw that the Supreme Court still relies on the doctrine of discovery, saying the radical or underlying title belongs to the Crown. So that's the dangerous part of Chilcotin. Um, but they did grant them Aboriginal title to part of their territory. But Jody was always compromising and going along uh, with that idea of, of the land claims policy of the, like I say, Pierre Trudeau started it. And um, in fact, she, when, when I Don't Know More started uh, in 2012, 2013, there was that big meeting in Ottawa chiefs across the country, actually in that same hotel, the Delta Hotel, where Pierre Trudeau had spoken to the chiefs in 1980. Theresa Spence was on her hunger strike, you know, calling for the Governor General to meet with the treaty uh, chiefs, you know, to talk about the lack of implementing treaties. <coughs> and uh, Jody was there as the BC uh, Regional Chief for AFN, supporting Sean Atlio, who was the National Chief then. And um, chief after chief got up and said, don't meet with uh, with um, Harper, you know, unless the Governor General is there because he represents the Queen and the Queen is, you know, that's who we signed treaties with. We didn't sign treaties with Canada, we signed treaties with Great Britain. You know, if you look at the historic treaties, it's, it's not with Canada. And so that's how come they always look down at these modern treaties as not being real treaties. Um, so there was a big debate and then that same day they were supposed to meet with um, Harper in Ottawa, January 2013. 
thousands of people came in on an I don't know more march and surrounded the Landsman building, you know, where the Prime Minister's office is and where the meeting was supposed to be. And uh, AFN, Jody and Adley and them were having a secret meeting at AFN where they were being told not to go to the meeting, but they decided to go. And so they went in and they had to go through throngs of people to get into the building. And people were shouting them down and denouncing them for going in. And AFN went in with their wish list, um, but all they came out with is that Harper agreed to two tables, Senior Oversight Committee, SOX, they called them Senior Oversight Committees, one on historic treaties and one on comprehensive claims. Perry Belgard, who was a vice chief for Saskatchewan, was supposed to be leading the uh, historic treaty one, and Jody Wilson Raybould was supposed to read comprehensive claims one to reform the policy. Um, we called them two dirty socks because we didn't agree with the process. In any case, in the end, Harper tossed that that comprehensive claims process aside when he found out that Jody Wilson Raybould, while she was still AFED BC regional chief announced she was the liberal uh, nominee for that new riding in uh, in Vancouver. And mm -hmm. so he, he killed the process right there once he found out she was running for the liberals. Well, what's fascinating is that her her blueprint, right, essentially... Well, I'm getting to that. Okay. She did it. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not... He for didn't it. include it in his book. It's not for nothing that in the book I describe Russ as a... Uh, uh, the man who speaks in hundred word footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> jo Jody's claim to fame with the liberals why they recruited her as a star candidate is because she wrote an 800 page tome, I think her husband really wrote it, Tim Raybould. Um, both of their names are on it. Um, where she basically colors inside the lines on how to work within the self-government and the, the comprehensive claims policies. Paul Martin saw that book and he recommended it to the Liberal Party. They recruited her to be a star candidate. They named her as Justice Minister. So she was pushing that. But what I, the, the point I want to talk about is in 19, uh, sorry, 2018, that point, you're talking about that meeting in September after the AFN election. One of the things that came out that was leaked out was a letter, and you, I think you mentioned it in the book, a letter from uh, senior Indigenous lawyers who had been negotiating with the federal government on this Recognition and Implementation of Rights Framework Act. Um, it was um, Mary Ellen Turpel, Willie Littlechild, Ed John, I think they were the main ones. They had written a letter to Trudeau saying, how come your justice minister is not involved in these negotiations because your officials are trying to introduce all these provisions saying that you have to jump through all these hoops to be recognized when the courts have already said well, we have recognized rights. And so they were questioning the Prime Minister, but it wasn't Trudeau who responded, it was Carolyn Bennett who responded in a letter saying thank you for your concern. And um, she said, here's our, they basically laid out what would be in the proposed legislation. And that's what was rejected at that AFN meeting was an outline document uh, of what they prepared, were prepared to introduce in the Parliament before Christmas. And that's what I guess you, you're saying we killed. But we didn't really kill it. Once we stopped that legislation, what they did was they started compartmentalizing it. And they passed the Language Act, the Indigenous Languages Act, the Child Welfare Act, two of the most vulnerable areas they've asserted federal control over now. and. Um, and then they've been negotiating the self-government and land claims policies uh, separately with their partners, which included, uh, you know, groups uh, in BC. So they've, they've been proceeding. And uh, right up to the time when, before they called the election, they issued a directive to uh, federal officials, negotiators, and they issued a BC, a new BC treaty negotiations policy, just for BC, not for the rest of the country that have Aboriginal title. So. And also the thing I should mention to conclude is um, <coughs> they passed a suite of legislation and one of the, the key bills that I saw as a threat was Bill C-97, which creates two new federal departments, one for Indigenous Services and one for Crown Indigenous Relations. Now that, that became law. So now they're gonna have two new federal departments. They've restructured the machinery of government, in my view, to now finish us off in these termination agreements. So whoever wins the election, that's why I've been telling people it doesn't matter to me if Scheer gets in or the Liberals get in, 
because they've laid the framework now to finish us off through policy and legislation and this new structure uh, using the new fiscal relationships, the money, because that's what drives everything, uh, to force our, our leaders and our communities into that path. And, you know, you do cover quite a bit of that in your book under the reconciliation industry. But I just want to say Jody got sidelined. I don't know how, if she had, um, she had a fight with Bennett, Trudeau backed her, and um, I don't know how much it plays into, you know, what happened with her role as Attorney General. I'm sure it didn't help. But I'd sure like to know what, I heard she wrote a 60-page document on that recognition bill, but they ignored it. So I'd sure like to hear her side of the story sometime, but she's claiming cabinet confidence, so I don't know if we'll ever find out. Well, she's got a book coming out in two weeks. Yeah, so <laughs> well, I don't know if she's going to reveal, though. I, yeah. I, think, I think what her book's going to say, it's going to be a rehash of her 800-page document, I think, saying, this is what I stand for, and this is why I, I think First Nations should be in Canada. <coughs> so it's going to be her platform, I think. I just want to thank uh, Martin again for spending. Um, he wasn't really my friend for the last while because he was very writing, so I'm glad to have him back. And um, yeah, buy a book for all your liberal friends. Yeah. <laughs>